Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for putting up with me. Uh, we're going back to 1928. Now, why 1928? It's because I find it a fascinating era. Because, really, when you look at it, 1927 was the beginning of modern America. You had washing machines in your house. You had refrigerators in your house. Television was being developed. I'm going to talk about TV in a minute. Radio was a big deal. And you had people like that. I believe my grandmother was a flapper. She died before I was born, but she was about 23 at the time. And um, she married a guy who was in his 30s so, um, and who frequented speakeasies. Uh, but those are the flappers. And uh, organized crime and prohibition were a big deal back in 1928, along with the fascination of it. Hey, you've heard this old saying, that's the best thing since sliced bread? Yeah. 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 You know when sliced bread finally came to America? 1928. 1928. Uh, Chrysler and Dodge merged. There was a presidential election featuring Herbert Hoover and the New York governor, Al Smith. Um, and the Nazis are just a fringe party in Germany. Uh, Mussolini ends women's voting in Italy, uh, and the uh, kellogg briand Pact basically out outlaws war, outlaws it. Of course, it's never been held up. Um, there was uh, penicillin, was discovered in 1928. You think it's such a long time ago, right? And all these things you use today, from 1928. Uh, oh, if you liked like me, watching uh, in the old days test patterns. That is the test pattern for uh, W2XB-TV, Schenectady, New York, <coughs> General Electric. That was uh, the station that had the first TV show. And you know how many people were able to watch the first ever TV show? Two. Four. So four. Four. Four people. Uh, oh, you heard the other day, or you might not have, that... Um, Mickey Mouse, Steamboat Willie, uh, the uh, copyrights ran out for the Disney company on Steamboat Willie and um, Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, at least this version of Mickey Mouse. This is now in public domain, and this is what got me interested in going back to 1928. How many of you grew up with Mickey Mouse cartoons, or Mickey Mouse this, or Mickey Mouse that? You can now use it, and you don't have to worry about paying Disney for it. It's in public domain. And uh, the talkies, the talkies uh, become more uh, prevalent in 1928. Uh, and radio, that's a radio studio, that's the Firestone uh, uh, show. And uh, American in Paris, George Gershwin, how many of you remember American in Paris? Yeah. yeah. And how many of you played with this? The yo-yo. Yo-yo. Yes. Yo-yo. Do you know when the yo-yo was really introduced in America? 1928. How about all these things that happened in 1928 that you ended up using? Um, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, the popular image of the uh, 1920s is that it was a decade of prosperity and riotous living and bootleggers and gangsters and rappers, that kind of rappers back in those days, and hot jazz, and flagpole sitters, and marathon dancing, and uh, it's all in the history books, and I'm sure that you encountered that in the history books. But the 1920s also was a time of deep cultural conflict, pitting a more cosmopolitan, modernist, urban culture against a uh, more provincial, traditional, and uh, also uh, rural setting. And you'll see this pronounced in the presidential election between Herbert Hoover and Al Smith. Um, the popular, that was the popular image, and uh, this is, was also a popular image, speakeasies. Now, anybody have ever visited a speakeasy long after they were closed? I was in Lake Tahoe about 20 years ago, and I went to this house, and um, they had an old speakeasy in there. And they kept it from those days because they knew that when they were going to get raided because they were tipped off, and all of a sudden they could flip everything and hide everything, and it looked just like a setting like this. Just a big room with a bunch of chairs. Hey, this is our reading room. And once the cops busted the place, and the cops knew that uh, the, the stuff was there, they went, oh, we can't find anything, 
This about an hour later, it went back to a speakeasy, but it doesn't look too different than your average bar, right? Uh, back in the day. Uh, there was a struggle between old and new America, immigration, race, alcohol, evolution, gender politics, sexual morality were all cultural battles. Uh, there was also uh, dries and wets and religious modernists against uh, religious fundamentalists and urban ethnics battled the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was a big deal back then. And there were also frivolity thing. Now, why would anybody sit on a flagpole? Why would anybody sit on a flagpole? You could say because it was there. Uh, the popular image is that of uh, that kind of living, but it was a decade that uh, tore America apart in a way. The culture of war combatants had one thing in common with the rest of the people. They wanted to make money, and throughout the 1920s, the U.S. economy expanded rapidly, and uh, the nation's total wealth more than doubled between 1920 and 1929, the Roaring 20s. And these were the flappers, and they were not like their mothers, nor were they like their grandmothers. Remember, their mothers grew up in the 1890s. Their grandmothers grew up in the 1870s. These were the women who came after the suffragettes, after people like Alice Paul and Trixie Forganza. And uh, it was the end of World War I, and these women, they went to high school. They graduated high school, they went to college, and they wanted to be equal to men, which is a problem in American society in the 1920s. Uh, the involvement in World War I started in 1917, lasted until 1918, and the women had to take all the jobs while the guys were over there. Remember, they were over there. Remember the song, Over There? Over There. Uh, when the war ended, many women said, uh, you know what? We kind of like making money. We kind of like being carefree and independent. We kind of like that lifestyle that our mothers didn't like or weren't able to do. Uh, the war ended, so uh, many women uh, also got the right to vote in 1920, but not all women got the right to vote. There were restrictions on Nat Native American, Asian American, Latinx, and African American women. Um, they couldn't vote. Some of them couldn't vote. Uh, the culture quickly shifted from women being expected to be wives who were subordinate to their husbands, uh, to women valuing independence and breaking the rules. They became the flappers, and there is a flapper, postcard girl of uh, that era. Um, unlike their mothers and their grandmothers, uh, flappers tended to go to high school. They went to college. They read books featuring confident, fun-loving ad adolescent heroines who uh, hiked and camped and solved mysteries. Flappers biked, they played golf. In fact, in the Great Gatsby, uh, there was a uh, woman's golf, amateur golf champion who turned into one of the characters in Great Gatsby. Uh, and tennis, and they strove to emulate the, the flat-chested, uh, hipless physiques of adolescent boys whose freedom and lack of domestic uh, responsibilities they envied. You know what they did? They basically, what they did with their boobs was flatten them out. Just flatten them out because that's the way they wanted to look in those days. Uh, their grave source of, they were a grave source of worry to their parents. They raised, look at my daughter. Look at what she's doing. Uh, to educators, hey, we didn't do that. To physicians, it's not healthy to be a flapper. To clergy, oh, this is blasphemous. Who feared that sports and higher education would ruin women. You think higher education would ruin women? That was the thinking. That was the thinking. And there they are, uh, basically doing the Charleston. Charleston. Uh, the post-war prosperity, the Coolidge prosperity, expressed itself in many ways. And one of the first being the availability of credit. You were able to get credit at stores. And what do you do with credit? I'll buy that and pay you later on for that, which would be the downfall of the stock market eventually. Department stores opened up as middle class, uh, uh, department stores opened up so the middle class could now use credit to obtain upper class luxuries, leading to the birth of consumerism. Except women were not allowed to get credit cards until 1974 in their own name. Really? Somebody else had to sign for their credit cards. 
their father, an uncle, a brother. A, prior to 1974, you weren't able to get it without it being co-signed. It became the law in 1974. So you probably got a credit card from a store, right? That was a little different. But I'm talking about v visas and, and, uh, and those type of cards of those days. Uh, with it came the flapper dress, mass produced for public consumption. Uh, new cosmetics sold skin creams to eradicate wrinkles. That doesn't change, does it? Uh, magazines advertised flapper hairstyles and uh, clothing, uh, plus extreme diets and dubious claims for slimming effects of cigarettes and chewing gum. You smoke a cigarette, you're going to lose weight. Some women resorted to a new uh, vogue in cosmetic surgery. Uh, what was that? Facelifts. They got facelifts. Uh, also, kicking off an era of damaging self-scrutiny and obsession with weight, youthfulness, and body image. How long did that last after that? It's still out there, right? This is a century later, and these things from the flapper days are still out there. Now it's called body shaving, right? Uh, oh, and there was the haircut. That's the actress, Louise Brooks, in the bob. Anybody have a bob at, any, at one point? That was the hair, flapper hairstyle. Flapper cut her hair short. It's what was called a bob. She wore shorter dresses. She rouged her knees. She made her knees red, as well as her cheeks. She drank alcohol. She smoked cigarettes and dated multiple men before marriage. Increased access to birth control, such as the diaphragm, allowed women to experiment with non-marital sex. And they went to speakeasies. And do you know who ran the speakeasies? Guys like him. Arnold Rothstein. Arnold Roth How many of you heard of Ro Arnold Rothstein? He was the guy who put organized in organized crime. Brilliant guy. Absolute brilliant guy. A whiz mathematically. Grew up in the Jewish family, didn't like going to school, kind of resented his father for being on the straight and narrow, and he decided he was going to go into crime, and he would mentor people eventually like Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky, and those people in Brooklyn. Uh, Arnold Rothstein was the guy who put organized in organized crime. On November 4th, Arnold Rothstein was shot. Uh, by an unidentified gunman at Manhattan Central Park, uh, Hotel, uh, Park Central Hotel, died of his wounds in the hospital the following day. Uh, his murder? Well, why was he murdered? Well, maybe he didn't want to pay off a $320,000 gambling debt from a three-day poker game. Uh, and this is a, a big deal because Arnold Rothstein may have, may have fixed the 1919 World Series. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the story, Eight Men Out, where eight Chicago White Sox players are indicted of fixing uh, the 1919 World Series. Al uh, Chicago got a $10,000, Shillish Joe Jackson, $5,000, and everybody thought it was Arnold Rothstein who, who put the fix in. Well, a lot of his associates did the fix, but Arnold Rothstein left no fingerprints. He was smarter than everybody else. He was known as the brain, among others, uh, names. He was the kingpin of the Jewish mob of New York City. Um, he was involved with the 1919 World Series. He won a lot of money betting on the series. That was fixed, but nobody could pin him for the crime. He was the mentor of crime bosses such as uh, Lucky Luciana, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, Bugsy Siegel. And you know what? Americans in those days couldn't get enough news about the gangsters. And that would continue into the future. Rothstein transformed organized crime from a thuggish activity by hoodlums into a big business run by like a corporation. And gained notoriety as uh, the person, first person, who realized that prohibition was a business opportunity, a means to enormous wealth, who understood the truths of the early 20th century capitalism of giving people what they want. And uh, here is uh, Arnold Goldstein, uh, Arnold uh, Rothstein with prohibition and a sign saying, uh, no booze sold here. What do you think? 
You think booze was sold there or not? Yeah. Of course it was. And New York was the epicenter. There were like 21,000 speakeasies in New York at the time. Rothstein saw the opportunity for business. He divested into bootlegging and narcotics. Liquor was brought in by smuggling along the Hudson River as well as Canada across the Great Lakes and into upstate New York. And I have a story for you. I was 18 years old. I was working at the Rockland County Drive-In in Muncie, New York, and our projectionist was a guy by the name of Albert Morris, who was 73 years old at the time. And um, he flew in World War I. He did fly in World War I, and after the war, he comes back to Rockland County. He's a Canadian uh, citizen who's married somebody in Rockland County. And uh, it, where we were, he lived in Spring Valley. Anybody familiar with Spring Valley? Yeah. Yep. If you're familiar with Spring Valley, it's over here, Route 45, cut right across Route 59, you end up in Suffering. Suffering is the major terminus from everything coming down from Canada by rail, and it sends it out to the west. And Al was telling me one day that uh, he was a bootlegger. I said, well, how'd you do it? I'm 18 years old. I want to know this. Well, how'd you do it? He said, it was simple. I'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd go to the Suffering train. There would be stuff left for me. I'd pick it up. He said, the authorities knew it was there. But he would bring it back to his house, put it in his bathtub, put water in the bathtub, he would actually he'd water it down, put it back in the bottles, go back to Suffern, and put it on the train going west. I said, who was it going to? I don't know. Was it going to Chicago? I don't know. I just put it on the train. Uh, I said, who paid you? I don't know. I just know they left money for me. And he was a bootlegger. Obviously, he put the stuff, he got it because he's a Canadian citizen, he got it from Montreal, and then he sent it out to Chicago. And uh, he made a lot of money. And then he dried up, and he became a projectionist at the movie theater. He's also uh, owned an airport uh, in Spring Valley. Rothstein also uh, purchased holdings in a number of speakeasies. He was, became the first to illegally import Scotch whiskey uh, in his own fleet of transatlantic freighters. Uh, he knew that high-end booze would be the chic thing to do when you go to the Cotton Club and watch somebody like Cab Calloway or Duke Ellington. By 1925, uh, Rothstein was one of the most powerful criminals in the country and uh, forged a large criminal enterprise. Uh, he was the biggest bootlegger in the nation until a guy by the name of George Rivas took over in Chicago. Uh, he had a reported wealth of over $10 million, which would be $150 million today. He was one of the wealthiest gangsters in history, and he's uh, widely considered to be one of the founding fathers of organized crime in the United States. And he was a big deal. Look at the Daily News, front page of the Daily News. Arnold Rothstein shot. People were fascinated by gangsters uh, back in the, well, you had Capone, they were fascinated with Capone as well. Uh, uh, Rothstein refused to pay because uh, he said the game was dishonest. Now, wait a minute, he's a crime boss. Isn't his whole life dishonesty? And he's worrying about morality over a game? Uh, George Hump McManus participant in the game would be arrested for Rothstein's murder, but he was later acquitted, lack of evidence. On his deathbed, Rothstein refused to identify his shooter, answering police inquiries with, you stick to your trade, I'll stick to mine. Me mother did it. My mother did it. Uh, how many of you use washing machines? You use washing machines, right? Yeah. Look at that one. You want to use that one? It's one of the first, one of the first electric washing machines in the country. And you put your stuff in, and there you go. Uh, advances in technology led to the age of electricity, and many homes in America, especially in the industrialized cities, were powered by electricity. Access to electricity in the 1990s provided Americans with power to require to run uh, new labor-saving devices, such as refrigerators washing machines, radios, phonographs, electric razors, and vacuum cleaners, things that you take for granted today, right? Well, you could take it for granted if you lived in a city, but if you lived in places like rural Tennessee, they had no electricity. 
Uh, I spoke at Central Michigan University in April of 1999 for a guy by the name of Walter Schneider, who was born in, uh, by Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, he told me growing up in the 1940s, he had no indoor plumbing. No indoor plumbing. So there was this great divide even into the 1940s. Well, how many of you have owned a Chrysler car? How many of you owned a Dodge? Well, in 1928, Walter Chrysler decided he was going to buy out the Dodge Brothers, and he does on May 28. Uh, he rescued a failing business that was barely meeting its payroll. Uh, Dillon, Reed, and company were unfamiliar with the automobile industry, and they were absentee owners and were not able to keep the firm going efficiently. Walter Chrysler's purchase of Dodge was a key element in his plans to challenge General Motors and Ford. He introduced the low-priced Plymouth. How about DeSoto? Anybody have a DeSoto here? Yeah, the Plymouth. Uh, DeSoto, in addition to Dodge, Chrysler had four major car lines and instantly became America's third largest automaker. Chrysler paid $170 million at the time, which was the largest business transaction in American history. The 1920s were a time of immense wealth and prosperity for some Americans. Uh, gross national product rose by 59%. The average person, the annual income was up by 38%. Uh, the new prosperity was uh, the automobile, which had become the largest industry in America led by General Motors and Ford. Uh, in the roaring 20s, cars tripled in their manufacturing can do, uh, consume 20% of steel, 80% of rubber, 75% of plate glass. Uh, any stock market players around today? Play the stock market? Well, if you played the stock market and you did it right in the 1920s, the Dow Jones Industrial Average went up 400%. But you had to know when to get out. So how many of you enjoy sliced bread? How many of you eat sliced bread? You realize before 1928 there was no such thing as sliced bread? Can you imagine a life without sliced bread? Well, your ancestors had a life without sliced bread. It's July 7th. Sliced bread is sold for the first time by the uh, Chillicothe Baking Company uh, of Missouri using a machine invented by Otto Frederick uh, Romwithin. It, uh, dis it was described as the greatest step forward in the baking industry. Uh, since the bread was wrapped and you just got it home, and you were able to have your own sliced bread. Instead of taking a knife and ripping it apart, you had sliced bread. Now, there was an early warning sign in 1928 that the market was going to crash. Uh, it was there. There was that early warning sign, but people ignored it. Uh, the Federal Reserve launched a very public campaign to slow down runaway stock prices by cutting off easy credit to investors. Starting in March, the great bull run began. During uh, that time, Americans were obsessed with the idea of buying stocks. Some stocks went up as much as 700%, but not everyone was getting rich. There were two Americans, the ones who had the money to play the market and the ones who didn't have the money and couldn't play the market. And there's a 1928 presidential race between Herbert Hoover and the New York governor, Al Smith. And this is a rather interesting race because religion is brought into this race almost immediately. Uh, Al Smith was a Catholic. Um, when Calvin Coolidge announced that uh, he would not run again, uh, the road was open for a new Republican nominee, Herbert Hoover was nominated on the first ballot at the Republican convention in Kansas City. After World War I, Hoover was the food administrator for uh, Europe and Secretary of Commerce in the Harding and Coolidge administrations. In his acceptance speech, Hoover stated that we in America today are nearer to the final Trump, uh, triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of this land. We shall soon, with the help of God, be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this land. Uh, his opponent was New York Governor Alfred Smith. 
He was nominated by the Democrats on the second ballot at, its, at their convention in Houston. And here's the problem, and it's a major, major problem. Al Smith was the first Roman Catholic ever to run for the presidency. This is a very significant issue uh, in the 1928 campaign. In fact, there were only two issues in the campaign, religion and prohibition. That was it, and religion dominates. Uh, and there is Herbert Hoover, and there is Al Smith. Uh, Smith was also running against a strong economy, the Coolidge uh, prosperity, or at least perceived strong economy that was built by President Warren G. Harding, who died in 1923, and Coolidge, his successor. One of the slogans that Hoover used was, a chicken in every pot, a car in every garage. You must have heard of that one, right? Yeah. Back in the day. Okay, so we got the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Here they are in the mid-1920s, and they're uh, marching in Washington in full view. The Ku Klux Klan's most popular, or they were them at its most popular, uh, in the United States during the 1920s, when its reach was nationwide. In fact, they owned a radio station in New York City. The license was transferred to uh, Washington, D.C. But the Klan, imagine this, the Klan owned a radio station in New York City. Uh, anyway, its reach was nationally. Uh, its members, disproportionately middle class, many of its visible activities geared towards festivities, pageants, and social gatherings. Hey, you know, come party with us. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're cool guys when we don't wear the, uh, the white cape and mask. Packing its noxious ideology as traditional small town values in wholesome fun, the plan of the 1920s encourage native-born white Americans to believe that bigotry, intimidation, harassment, and extra-legal violence were all perfectly compatible with uh, patriotic respectability, or part of patriotic respectability. And anti-Catholicism was a significant problem for Smith's campaign. Protestant ministers warned that he would take orders from the Pope whom many Americans sincerely believed would move to the United States and rule the country from Washington, D.C. They haven't been to Vatican City. There's a lot of money there, far more money than Washington, D.C. So uh, here's a cartoon with Smith, and uh, here's uh, the Pope, and also Cardinals there, and Al Smith is invited to the table. A popular joke at the time was that uh, Smith, sent a one-word telegram after the election to uh, Pope Pius VI uh, saying, unpack. Uh, many voters who sincerely rejected bigotry and the anti-Catholic Ku Klux Klan justified their opposition to Smith on the belief that the Catholic Church was un-American and alien culture opposed to freedom and democracy. Uh, Smith also was in favor of legalizing booze. Uh, and if you were at one of his campaign stops, you might get a can opener. A can opener or bottle opener, because there were no cans in 1928. It was all bottles. They were trying to get beer in a can, but they couldn't. That's a bottle opener. So, hey, go open up a bottle of beer. Smith called openly for prohibitions repeal, angering Southern Democrats. At the same time, the Anti-Saloon League, the Women's Christian Temperance Union and other supporters of the temperance uh, movement exploited Smith's anti-prohibition politics, dubbing him Alcoholic Smith uh, and uh, spreading rumors about his own addiction to drink and liking him with moral decline. A popular radio preacher put Smith in the same camp as card-playing, cocktail-drinking, poodle dogs, divorces, novels, stuffy rooms, dancing evolution, Clarence Darrow, new art, prize-fighting actors, greyhound racing, and modernism. I come to think of it, I could fit into that without a problem. Uh, Herbert Hoover, well, he would win the election. Uh, and, you know, the sad part about Herbert Hoover's legacy was he was probably the most capable man who was president in the 20th century. Uh, he was a doer, he got things done, and he had the Depression. But he wins the election before the Depression. But 
if you look at his record, he was a powerhouse. Uh, the Republicans swept the election in November. Hoover carried 40 states, including Al Smith's New York, all border states, and five traditional Democratic states in the South. Hoover ran as the candidate of prosperity and economic growth. And there was also one other strange thing for that time about Herbert Hoover. His running mate was Charles Curtis, and he was a Native American. Think of that. He was a Native American. Uh, he is the only vice president ever known to have been a Native American or of Native American uh, heritage. Well, while Americans are partying, there's problems brewing. In, there are problems brewing in Europe. Uh, that was Kaiser Wilhelm. The First World War is over August, uh, in, rather in November uh, 11, 1918. And the First World War and its subsequent peace settlements gave rise to new ambitions, rivalries, and tensions. People had high expectations that the post-war peace settlement would create a new world order and ensure that the slaughter of the First World War would never be repeated. And these are the four guys who are carving up Europe. The guy on the right is Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States. The others there are David Lloyd George of Great Britain, Materia Orlando of Italy, George Clemenceau of France. Uh, and it's unfinished business. They have to finish it off. The war ends on November 11, 1918, after four years of fighting. The Americans got involved in 1917 in the loss of millions of lives. The Treaty of Versailles was signed in June 1919, created the League of Nations, an international body intended to promote peace and prevent war. America never joined the League of Nations for various reasons, including isolationism. The treaty was an uneasy compromise, as each of the victorious allies, the Brits, the Americans, French, and Italy, looked to pursue their own interests. In fact, in Italy, Mussolini is accumulating power at this point. Germany was forced to surrender territory, disarm, and pay for the war's damage. These divisive conditions were criticized as overly vindictive by many in Britain and America. The treaty's terms caused immediate outrage and lasting bitterness in Germany. There is an irony in all of this. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles left Germany in pretty good position uh, by creating Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the Baltic States. And the treaty put a buffer between Germany and one of its, its traditional rivals, Russia. Fighting among the new states weakened them. The geography of the new borders made them difficult to defend. But Germany emerged from the war with small, relatively weak states on its eastern border. The Treaty of Lausanne in Switzerland would end the war in 1923 officially. Uh, the senior statesmen stopped working on the uh, treaty in 1919. Uh, but the war would end in June of, July of 23. Uh, the Treaty of Lausanne was signed by France, Britain, Italy, Japan, Greece, Romania, and the New Republic of Turkey. So why did Hitler hate Jews? Why did he hate Jews? Because he bought into the big myth. He bought into a big lie. Uh, during World War I, between 1914 and 1918, Adolf Hitler, who was an Austrian, was a uh, soldier in the German army. At the end of the war, he and many other German soldiers like him couldn't get over the defeat of Germany or the German Empire. Uh, the German army command spread the myth, the lie, that the army had not lost the war on the battlefield, but because they had been betrayed. Who betrayed them? Who betrayed the Germans? It was called a stab in the back. Uh, Hitler bought into the lie. He bought into the myth. Jews and communists had betrayed the country and brought a left-wing government to power that had wanted to throw in the towel. And this is where Nazism starts in 1920 with the speech by this guy who is Austrian, who was wounded in World War I, and it's not even a German. Um, it's February 24th, 1920, and Adolf Hitler delivered the Nazi Party platform speech to a large crowd in Munich. This is the beginning of the, or the foundation of Nazism. The German Workers' Party already existed. Hitler was a great orator, and he laid out a 25-point platform. Central idea? Strengthen German citizenship by excluding and controlling Jewish people and others deemed non-German. Like him, 
He's not German. Uh, some Germans began to support Adolf Hitler, even though he is an Austrian. He is a non-German. He writes Mein Kampf in 1923-24 after he's thrown in jail. It's his struggle. I don't know what his struggle is, but he has a struggle. And he predicted a general European war that would result in the extermination of the Jewish race in Germany. Mein Kampf was written in jail after he was arrested for his participation in the Beer Hall Push in Munich on November 9th and 10th, 1923, when the Nazi party tried to overthrow the government. He's arrested, but he's released in, from jail December 1924. And these are his cohorts. Uh, this is the Nazi party, 1922. <laughs> By blaming Jews for the defeat, Hitler created a stereotypical enemy. In the 1920s, the defeated country was still in a major economic crisis. According to the Nazis, expelling the Jews was the solution to all the problems that Germany had. Uh, Germans said no to Nazis in 1928. There was an election, uh, and the Nazi party did not fare well. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazi party, was a small party on the radical right of the German political spectrum. In the Reichstag uh, parliament elections of May 2nd, the Nazis received only 2.6% of the vote. Um, and basically, there was a, uh, that was less than 1924 when they got 3%. And on November 17th, in the Berlin town elections, the Nazis won just 13 of 225 seats. Overnight, it was like they flipped the switch to take care of this guy. Uh, as a result of the election, a grand coalition of Germany's Social Democrat, Catholic Center, German Democratic, and German People's Parties governed the Weimar Germany in the first six months uh, of the economic turndown the, in 1929. Uh, the Nazis were marginalized. The Nazis, were they a fringe party? Or weren't they? Uh, on September 28th, following the four per poor performance of the National Socialists in the May 20th general election, the Prussian government lifted its ban, speaking ban, on Hitler. Hitler's first speech was in Berlin at an arena. 12,000 people came out to see him. Meanwhile, in Italy, women, it's mostly women here, do you think women should be voting? No. No? No, I won't be you, you and Benito Mussolini, right? No, yeah. So everybody else, you think women should be voting? Yes. You're outnumbered here. It's oh, one, right. two, three, four. So what do you think? The rest of you, should women be voting? Yes, yes. or no? Yes. Yes. Uh, on May 12th, uh, in a speech to the Senate, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, announced a number of reforms to the government, and chief among them was the end to women's suffrage. Suffrage. The new laws also restricted the right to vote to men over the age of 21, uh, and they would have to pay uh, to vote as well, uh, 100 lira, which was at that time uh, a big amount of money in Italy. Uh, the kellogg briand Pact was supposed to outlaw war. In the spring of 1927, the French foreign minister, Aristide Briand, suggested a bilateral non-aggression pact with the U.S. Taking up the uh, idea, the U.S. Secretary of State, Frank B. Kellogg, proposed a multilateral treaty signed by all the major powers in the world. French said yes. The pact was signed on August 27th. War is outlawed. Two articles. Uh, the high contracting parties solemnly declare, declare in the names of their respective peoples that they condemn recourse to war for a solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy in their relations with one another. Article 2, the high contracting parties agree that the settlement of solutions of all disputes of whatever nature or of whatever origin they may be, which may arise among them, shall never be sought uh, except by uh, Pacific means. War was outlawed. Every war since then allegedly is illegal, and the people who declared war sh are, should be treated as war criminals. But that never happened. Uh, Fleming, he finds penicillin. 
Uh, the uh, uh, Alexander Fleming uh, discovers penicillin by accident, studying the flu, influenza. Remember, we're coming out of the Spanish flu in 1919, 1920, 1921. So they're looking for a cure. Uh, what he says is this. One sometimes finds what one is not looking for. When I woke, woke up just past dawn on September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic or bacteria killer. But I suppose that's exactly what I did. So how many of you watch TV? Yeah. How many of you grew up with TV? How many of you remember your first TV? How many of you remember sitting down, putting the TV on, sitting down, waiting for the picture tube to warm up, warmed up, and then it either rolled or you had snow and you had to figure out, should I stop the rolling or clear the snow first? How many of you did that? Playing with the rabbit ears or standing like that? How many of you did that? You know, I tell my, my kids, we had such a hard time watching TV. We did. I mean, we suffered to watch TV. Well, did Ernest uh, Alexanderson from Sweden uh, invent TV? Yes or no? WRGB, then W2XB, uh, started as the world's first television station. It broadcast from the General Electric Facility in Schenectady. It was popularly known as WGY Television. Dr. Ernest Alexanderson first demonstrated his television system in late 1927. In January, GE began broadcasting his 2XB on 790 kilohertz using a 24-line mechanical standard. Soon afterwards, the station switched to 48 lines. Do you know how big the TV screen was? See the size of my watch? Slightly bigger, one and a half inches. One and a half inches. On January 13th, Dr. Alexanderson performs the first successful public television broadcast. The pictures with 48 lines at 16 frames per second are received on sets with a 1.5 square inch screen in the uh, homes of four general electric executives in Schenectady. There were four of them. Uh, the sound is transmitted by WGY radio, so you have to use a radio as well. On September 11, the country's first television drama, The Queen's Message, was broadcast by W2XB in, uh, in Schenectady. And there is the set. Now, you've got to compress this into something that's an inch and a half. But there they are. They're performing the play. Uh, the Queen's Message was a radio drama adapted for television and broadcast with both sound and moving pictures, they were received by television sets three inches in di di diameter that were set up in various places in Schenectady and area. There were special effects props for this broadcast to enhance the actors' performance and their sounds. Uh, this guy, Vladimir Zworkin, was the guy who uh, worked at uh, perfecting a picture tube. In 1923, he came up with the iconoscope. Uh, he was working for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh at the time. This is the first image ever on TV. That's the first image ever. And it's John Logie Bard's image. He was working in Europe. Uh, on uh, March 25th, 1925, the Scottish inventor uh, John Logie Baird made the first ever public display of moving visuals on TV. January 26, 1926. He gave his first public demonstration of true images uh, for members of the Royal Institute and a reporter from the Times of London in his laboratory at 22 First Street, Soho District of London. Baird's business partner, Oliver Hutchinson, was on the screen. And there's his logo, Baird Television. Uh, he demonstrated the world's first color transmission on July 3rd. Imagine that color TV in 1928 was there. A few months earlier, on February 9th, Baird set up the Baird Television Development Company, which made its first transatlantic television transmission from London up the street to Hartsdale. Somebody in Hartsdale was able to watch television that emanated in London. 
Philo Farnsworth came up with more uh, innovations for TV. Uh, he was trying to get a picture to, and he does, September 7, 1927. He's the first to transmit a television image composed of 60 horizontal lines. The press was presented with the scientific breakthrough on January 13, and it headlined, it headlined in a few newspapers. This guy had the first TV station that actually functioned in Washington, Charles Francis Jenkins. Uh, on July 2nd, uh, he begins broadcasting uh, in uh, Wheaton, Maryland, outside of Washington, W3XK. His first program, I don't know, how many would you watch a 10-minute show featuring a revolving windmill? <laughs> would you sit there for 10 minutes watching a windmill? No. Somebody did. Uh, in December, Jenkins formed the Jenkins Television Corporation in New Jersey to manufacture radio visors or televisions. Jenkins may have invented the first TV set in the United States. He used radio receivers that had a special attachment that allowed the receivers to broadcast moving pictures on a six-inch square mirror. Jenkins made the first public display of radio vision on June 23, 1935. Although he said, I did this before, on June 24th, 1923, most TV scholars think he was lying. And uh, this guy, Hugo Gernsback, he's watching his TV. Somewhere, somewhere in there, there's a picture, television number. Um, Hugo uh, had WRNY radio in New York, and, um, and then he started putting out live pictures. Uh, transmitting a system developed by a South American inventor. Uh, it transmits 48 uh, line images. WRNY was the second to broadcast television pictures to the general public after W3XX in, or W3XK in Washington. How many of you remember Felix the Cat? Yeah. Felix the Cat. Yeah. This is NBC's first TV show. That's it. They put it on, they had a, a drawing of Felix, and they just put the TV camera on Felix the Cat. But Felix the Cat is the first star of TV? Maybe. Uh, in April, a Felix the Cat doll, uh, about 12 inches tall, made of wood, was used by RCA in their mechanical television tests. Could be argued that Felix the Cat was television's first star. That's a TV of uh, around that era. Uh, television was a laboratory experiment. 1927, AT&T had demonstrated a system that sent television images and sounds over telephone lines. The General Electric Research Laboratory in Schenectady uh, was sending experimental television over their shortwave radio in the new year. Uh, Westinghouse had a system that would broadcast motion pictures. Uh, several other laboratories were also conducting experiments and demonstrations. It's a developing medium. How many of you remember Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse. and yeah. Steamboat Willie? That's it. Poor Disney, the Di Walt Disney Corporation, or company, Walt Disney Company. On Monday, January 1st, 2024, they lost copyright protection to Steamboat Willie, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse. Uh, 95 years were up. That's it. You can only hold it for 95 years. On November 18th, Mickey Mouse and his partner Minnie debuted in an animated short, Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie is notable for being one of the first cartoons with synchronized sound, as well as one of the first cartoons to feature a fully post-produced soundtrack. Mickey Mouse's public debut was in Steamboat Willie. Hey, do you know what Mickey Mouse's original name was? You have any idea? No. You think it was Mickey Mouse? Michael. Michael? How many of you have grandchildren or great-grandchildren and want to show that you're smarter than they are? How many of you? Great-grandchildren? Yeah. How many of you want to show that you're smarter than they are? Because ask them what Mickey Mouse's real name was. His original name, Mortimer Mouse. His name was Mortimer. Walt Disney named him that, but his wife didn't like it. 
Disney, uh, Lillian Disney said, no, no, I hate the name Mortimer. Call him Mickey Mouse. The wife won. The wife's the Boston family, isn't she? <laughs> the wife won. Now, uh, the original character for Mickey Mouse is based on this guy, Oswald, the lucky rabbit. Uh, Walt Disney's first uh, series of animated films was in 1927, they and it featured Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. When his distributor appropriated the rights to the new character, Disney said, hey, you're going to steal it from me? I'm going to alter Oswald's appearance, and he's going to become Mortimer Mouse. But he's not Mortimer Mouse, he's Mickey Mouse. And there is... Uh, what? What? What did you say? I said fantastic. Fantas you're going to fool your grandkids now, right? Ask him. There is Steamboat Willie. Mickey Mouse steers a steamboat down the river. He entertains his passenger, Minnie, who's just on the ship at that point, by playing music out of a, uh, Mariah, uh, by a bunch of characters on the boat. Uh, two silent Mickey cartoons actually preceded that, uh, Plain Crazy and Galloping Gaucho. Uh, steamboat Willie was an immediate success. Uh, the Talkies, uh, The Lights of New York, that may be the real first talking movie. Uh, some films, like The Jazz Singer, had sound, but most, most of the uh, film movies at that point were silent movies. On July 6th, Lights of New York, starring Helen Costello, released by Warner Brothers, it is the first 100% talkie feature film. Dialogue is spoken through the film. Previous releases, Don Juan and the Jazz Singer, used synchronized soundtrack with sound effects and music, uh, and uh, the Jazz Singer has a couple words spoken by Al Jolson. On uh, December 25th, in Old Arizona, it's released by Fox Films, 20th Century Fox, the first sound on feature length talkie. It's also the first Western talkie and first film shot outdoors. Radio is a big deal, and these, these two characters were the biggest deal in radio in 1928, Amos and Andy. On March 9th, Amos and Andy debuted on the NBC Blue Network, broadcast from WMAQ in Chicago, owned by the Chicago Daily News. Amos and Andy was an American radio sitcom about black characters, initially set in Chicago. The actors playing Amos and Andy, uh, Freeman Gostin and Charles Correll, were white. The pair started on WGN in Chicago. You know what WGN stands for? No. World's Greatest Newspaper, because it was owned by the Chicago Tribune. There was also another station in Chicago, WLS. Uh, you know what WLS stood for? World's Largest Store. It was owned by Sears. Uh, with Sam and Henry, uh, WGN refused to syndicate the program. Both left. The characters' names were owned by WGN. So they started over with new names. Uh, about an old show. By the middle of the 1920s, it was obvious to radio manufacturers uh, and networks that uh, you needed advertising. And advertising was dis discovered that radio was one of the most effective means of reaching consumers. Radio's popularity continued to grow. Biggest program, like Amos and Andy, heard by more than 40 million people. Advertisers were paying up to $50,000 Multiply that by about 21, 22 now, and uh, that's you know millions of dollars to single uh, to sponsor a single program. Shows like The Voice of Firestone, a concert music program, and the National Farm and Home Hour, a rustic variety show, which featured Don Amici and others, were immensely popular. How many of you like Gershwin? Yeah. Yes. Which one, George or Iowa? Both. Both. <laughs> Both. Both. American in Paris. Well, Ira wasn't involved with this one. Uh, after a string of popular shows and Broadway hits, George Gershwin's next work was written for the concert stage, Rhapsody in Blue. Uh, it was so successful, it prompted Broadway composer Irving Berlin to call Gershwin the only songwriter I know who became a composer on April 13th. An American in Paris premiered at Carnegie Hall in New York. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 practice. practice. Uh, how many of you have had a yo-yo in your life? Yes. 
you can thank this guy for the yo-yo. His name is Pedro Flores. He's a Filipino who ended up in California. And it's his thing. He didn't invent it, but he brought it back to the United States. It's believed the yo-yo most likely originated in China. Uh, and the first historic mention of the yo-yo is from Greece in the year 500 BC. In the 1920s, a man named Pedro Flores brought the first uh, Filipino yo-yo to the United States and began a yo-yo company by the same time in, at the same by the same name in California. Flores started selling the toy labeled with the name yo-yo, meaning come come. Did you know that? Do you know yo-yo means come come in Filipino? Uh, Flores patented an innovation to yo-yos that used a loop instead of a knot around the axle, allowing for new tricks such as the ability to put the yo-yo to sleep. How many of you could walk the dog? Walk the dog. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't. I was terrible at the yo-yo. Terrible. So much so I never even showed the yo-yo to my kids or my grandkids. My wife had to do that. The 1928 legacy, well, Herbert Hoover won the election. After leaving the White House because of the Depression, uh, Hoover became a vociferous critic of Roosevelt's uh, economic policies. He warned that the New Deal had a pronounced odor of totalitarian government and attacked Franklin Roosevelt's agricultural policies as goose-stepping the people under the pinkish banner of planned economy. The irony? Roosevelt's New Deal owed much of its success to what Hoover had begun. Hoover became the chairman of the Boys Clubs of America in 1936. There were nearly 300 clubs in 150 cities and towns by 1960. Boys Clubs of America had more than 600 clubs in 300 cities serving 600,000 boys. It's now the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Hoover served in the Harry Truman administration, President Harry Truman, in the 1940s. He died in 1964. Hoover called what happened in 1929 the Depression. Hoover was proud of the fact that he was the only living American with a depression named after him. He could joke about it eventually. So what happened to these women? Well, they grew up. Well, they couldn't go anywhere after the Depression wiped out money. So they became stay-at-home moms. The flapper life and look disappeared, and the roaring 20s glitz and glamour came to an end in America after the Wall Street crash, October 29th, 1929. Unable to afford the latest trends and lifestyles, the once vibrant flapper women returned to their drop hemlines, and the flapper dress disappeared. 1963, Betty Friedan released the book, The Feminine Mistake, which referenced the flappers it was the start of the women's rights movement in the 1960s. How many of you read this book, The Great Gatsby? Sure, sure. Well, in F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby, Meyer Wolfsham is a Jewish friend and a mentor to Jay Gatsby, described as a gambler who fixed the World Series. Gee, I wonder who that was about. The character is commonly assumed to be an allusion to Arnold Rothstein. Rothstein is referred to as the brain in several of Damon Runyon's short stories, including a fictional version of his death in The Brain Goes Home. Rothstein may have been the inspiration for the character Nathan Detroit, who appears in Guys and Dolls. Guys and Dolls. Um, the legacy, here's a Dodge. Uh, Chrysler merged with uh, German, the German brand uh, Dabbler-Benz in 1998. The merger of the Chrysler Group with Fiat created the Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. Uh, Stellantis, a European multinational automotive corporation, is the current owner of Dodge. It also owns uh, Chrysler, Fiat, Jeep, and Maserati. By the way, do you know who the Jeep was named after? <coughs> the Popeye the, character, Popeye the Sailor character. Jeep. Oh, okay. That's who it was named after. Uh, that is me in Rockstock, uh, Germany, former East Germany. Uh, the Kellogg Briand uh, Agreement had little effect in stopping the rising militarism in the 1930s and the start of World War II. Hitler and Mussolini were allies. 
Germany annexed uh, Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938. Germany invaded Poland September 1, 1939. That starts World War II. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. That war ended in 1945. Somebody's getting a jab in the rear end. Penicillin. Penicillin. Uh, Fleming published uh, his findings in 1929, but nobody wanted to help him. Nobody. Uh, during that time, he sent his mold to anyone. Anyone, help me out with this. It took until 1939 when somebody became interested. In 1941, scientists were ready to get the drug on the market. That's a TV today. This is a TV today. Uh, the first regularly, regular electronic television service, Germany, uh, began uh, in Berlin, March 22, 1935. The Nazis planned on using television as a propaganda tool. The first commercial television station was in New York, W2XBS. WNBT Channel 1 started on April 30, 1939, broadcasting from the Queen's World's Fair, about 400 television sets were in use. Uh, my wife, the Walt Disney story. On uh, January 1st, 2024, Mickey and Minnie Mouse enter public domain as uh, its United States copyright expired. Anyone that's free to use the 1928 version of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse without copyright infringements, just like Walt Disney did in making his 1937 Snow White animated feature. Snow White was in public domain. He just took it and became his. Uh, along with other companies seeking to protect intellectual property, rights Disney lobby for the 1998 Copyright Extension Act that extended <coughs> by 20 years, 295 years, the shield for published works. Such was Disney's congressional influence that the law became known as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act. Uh, this guy here is Al Michaels, a sports announcer. That's uh, Dennis Miller, the comedian. That's my son, about 20 years ago. And I bring up Al Michaels, the sportscaster, for one reason. Uh, in 2015, Disney, ABC, traded sportscaster Al Michaels to NBC in exchange for Oswald the Rabbit. Uh, Disney CEO Bob Iger knew Oswald was a precursor to Mickey Mouse, designed personally by Disney for Universal Pictures back in the 1920s, and Bob Iger understood it was important to the Disney family. Oswald was back at Disney for eight years in January 2023. Uh, the copyrights of several of the original Oswald shorts, as well as the character expired. Those films and the character are now in public domain. Singing in the Rain. How many of you watch Singing in the Rain? Oh, yeah. Remember at the end, at the end of Singing in the Rain, the woman who was the silent movie star used her own voice. It was, you know, it was a funny voice. That's what happened to some of the silent uh, movie stars. Uh, talkies changed the way films were produced and distributed. Since most theaters in the 1920s used live orchestras and not projected sound, they didn't have the equipment needed to play sound films. Due to box office success of the early talkies, theaters began the expensive process of wiring for sound, and by 1930, 10,000 of uh, 15,000 cinemas in the United States were retrofitted with the necessary technology. The last widely released silent film was Modern Times in 1936, which was a silent film, synchronized sound effects and music. A number of silent movie stars could not make the adjustment to talkies. That's the NBC Blue Network. Uh, Golden Age of Radio ended around 1955 at the end of the Jack Benny program. Benny was a mainstay from 1932 through 55, the last star of the Golden Age to end his radio program. AM Radio Today is worthless, and electric vehicle manufacturers contend that AM radios interfere with the vehicles and want to drop the AM band entirely. American in Paris. Uh, it took on a new life uh, on stage and screen 14 years after George Gershwin's death in 1951. MGM movie uh, producer asked Ira Gershwin 
if he would be interested in making a musical based on the songs that uh, he wrote with his brother. Iris said, sure. Uh, in the classic film with Gene Kelly, went on to win six Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Musical Score. The Yo-Yo. Donald Duncan. How many of you had Duncan Yo-Yos? Donald Duncan capitalized on the work of yo-yo pioneer Pedro Flores, purchasing Flores's yo-yo manufacturing company in the early 1930s. He then employed Flores to promote yo-yo play while Duncan Toys, the company, manufactured and marketed the toy. On that note, any questions, any comments? It's your turn to talk. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you. Very good. Yes. But it's your turn to talk. Anybody have any memories of some of this stuff? Sure. Yeah, lots of them. <laughs> so. I remember how exciting television was. Uh, you get a television set? Yeah. Uh, I, I still okay. remember that. Yeah. Uh, so. We'll see you in two weeks. Okay. We'll be back here in two weeks. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but we'll talk about something. <laughs> What's two weeks? Two weeks from today, two I'll weeks be back. from today. I will be back. Yes, and in February, we're going to talk about the Mardi Gras. Maybe I'll bring some beads with me. <coughs> so, anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.